Greetings, Hurley Burleyites. May I share with you David Hurley's two-legged tales of woe? It goes like this. In the last three years, I've badly broken my right leg, badly bruised my left kneecap and patella, and developed blood clots and severe swelling in my right leg. Don't try to imagine it. This is not a road you want to go down. The point is, in each case, I was able to get the excellent care I needed and get better. But there are more than 235,000 Canadians who experience homelessness every year and can't readily access the medical care they need. That's why our presenting sponsor, TELUS, has developed their Health for Good program and mobile health clinics. The mobile health clinics, powered by TELUS Health, are fully equipped vans with onboard health care providers using electronic medical record technology on the TELUS LTE Wi-Fi network to deliver immediate and quality care in the communities that need it most. They offer routine testing, contraception, STI treatment, harm reduction services and mental health care, immunizations, counseling, and more. By the end of 2020, TELUS' mobile health clinics will be coast-to-coast, enabling 20,000 patient interactions per year. Health for Good is just one part of TELUS' All Connected for Good program, which bridges the digital divide and helps ensure that all Canadians, regardless of their location or circumstances, are all connected to the technology and resources they need. To learn more, go to connectingcanadaforgood.ca. Hello, I'm David Hurley, and this is the Hurley Burley. Today, we've got a really special pod. My friend Pat Sorbera is our guest. Hello, Pat. Hi, David. But there's a twist coming up in a few seconds. For those who don't know, Pat has been a peerless political organizer and advisor for the Liberal Party for over 40 years in Ontario and federally. She's worked for opposition leaders, premiers, cabinet ministers, and so many candidates. And of course, she was integral to, and my partner in, Kathleen Wynne's majority victory in Ontario in 2014. We've eaten a lot of questionable late-night pizza together, Pat. (laughs) She's renowned, perhaps infamous, for expressing her views with an uncompromising honesty and directness. And undoubtedly, we're going to hear that today. But, and anyone who really knows Pat knows this to be true, she is probably the biggest heart of anybody working in politics. Now, here's the twist. You're not going to hear that much from me in this interview. I'll be in the room and chiming in, but I've asked Jenny Byrne to carry this interview. First of all, Pat and my careers intersect so much that it's fair to have somebody else talk to her about it. And second of all, we'll get a far richer picture of what life is like for women in politics when the conversation comes from two figures as senior and central to power as Jenny and Pat. Pat has a new book out called Let Him Howl. That's probably uh, the focus of much of our discussion, but not all of our discussion today. Pat Cerbero, welcome to this special episode of The Hurley Bernie. And over to Jenny Byrne. <laughs> well done. That was good. That was good. Uh, that was good. Well, uh, uh, thank you, David and Pat. Thank you. I'm I'm a bit thank nervous. You. I've never now. I now I see how the, like I feel like a bit in the hot seat. Mm. Um, I have to say I loved your book. Uh, I read it. Uh, mm-hmm. I read it over the holidays. I know I messaged you about it. It was. Um, uh, it was such a honest and heartfelt view of what it's like to be uh, a woman in politics. And it actually brought back a ton of memories personally um, uh, that I never actually even thought of. And so I thought how your book was constructed in terms of the different themes and, and uh, uh, chapters uh, was just, it was, it was so good. And so I picked a few, we we could probably talk for hours, but I picked a few of things that we could discuss. And I, I, I want to hear more, like, I want to hear from you. I, I, I have some stuff I, I can, uh, I can add, but in kind of no particular order, I'd like to start. I, I thought that, uh, um, the chapter, the earn your stripes lesson, uh, and I'd like to, uh, expand on that. My, my, what I used to, to tell kids coming up and, and especially women is, uh, basically never say no. So every opportunity you're given, whether it's to attend a leader's dinner, to door knock in a by-election, to participate in a call center, to do whatever, don't say no because you never know who you're going to meet. You never know what you're going to learn. And that's something that, um, you know, I know. I, I remember my first leader's dinner. I got on the Greyhound bus in Ottawa mm. and uh, – brought it to Toronto and then took the overnight Greyhound bus back to see Preston Manning speak. And so I just was hoping you could expand on that and how that kind of led you into your, uh, into your career. 
Well, following on what you just said in terms of, and first of all, I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. I am a big fan of the Hurley Burley, and I'm sure after today, the Hurley Bernie. <laughs> and I, uh, I think that's great. And I, uh, I, I'm really honored to be here today. So uh, I think the, the reason I put the Earn the Stripes um, lesson, because uh, it is a book about lessons, and mm-hmm. you can certainly share in those from uh, life and background politics, is the is the fact that if you're getting into politics and you think you're going to start at the top, you're, you're going to get into the rough waters pretty darn fast because you're just going to find that um, unless you're kind of related to somebody and get to the table that way, you're, you're going to be... Yeah, I, that's what we call them anyways. Call them yeah. what? Donor babies. Uh, do- yeah, exactly. You're going <laughs> <you're gonna be, laughs> to be pushed to the sidelines pretty fast and you're probably going to have trouble making it through. So exactly what you said. And... and the way, well, the way I dealt with that is, hey, if we were putting stickers on you vote at cards, I sat down at the table and put stickers on you vote at cards, even if I had other responsibilities, to sort of signal to people coming in, we're, we just all got to work till the job is done. Mm-hmm. That really was the lesson. You all work at it till the job is done. Um, but it's a it's a hard thing to to teach um, people coming in because they, they want to show their strength and they don't understand that that strength is just pitching in and being part of getting it done. So that's why that lesson was early. And for me, it was very early because as I talk about in Guelph, I worked with all these fantastic women. And if you weren't prepared to sweep the floor, you were out the door, man. Yeah. So so would you say your mentors in politics were women or did you have some men as well? Because I found, I, I can't, I actually can't really name a woman who would have been uh, a mentor to me. I, I would say one of my biggest mentors was was Doug Finley. Uh, he, uh, uh, when I was very young, he allowed me to make a lot of mistakes uh, in in politics. He allowed me to sit at the table uh, with a lot of senior people who, at the time, I didn't realize that I was completely out of place and shouldn't right. speak the way that I did. Yeah. Uh, but he let me make a lot of mistakes, and he gave me an opportunity. So, were there any mentors in your uh, in your career that that kind of stand out? So my early mentors were women because I was just looking. Like that was the time when things were starting to. Gotta remember, this is like well before your time. So the women, women, the goal, the view of women was starting to change. Um, so I was looking for the women who were breaking through, and I, I talk in the book about. But they were women in the back room. So so in Guelph, they were the ones who just you know they just <laughs> did everything, and if they didn't think the the direction they were given was right, they'd go they'd go at the guys and talk about it. Um, but um, in the, in the early days, uh, I can't. I can't. Actually, I can't think of uh, of, a, of a male that I that I would have said was actually a mentor, but um, no, not in the early days. They were all women. Deb Matthews. I talk about Terry O'Leary because mm-hmm. when I did the Martin leadership in 1990, I I really had to learn the trenches, and I'd be calling up into Ottawa, and she'd almost be the one that was always there answering yeah. the phone. And um, Deb Matthews, Heather Peterson in government. Yeah. Well, it reminds me of the the you you had a couple you had a Margaret Thatcher quote in your in your book, but the the one I always like it's the the one that uh, if you want something said in politics, ask a man. If you want something done, uh, right. ask a woman. No offense, David. You've been very quiet. <laughs> I'm a today. good talker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I mean, the men, the men. There were lots of men there, and you could they were yeah. approachable, and you could talk about things, and you could you know go to them with your issues and problems, and you usually had to ask permission to show up in a meeting. But in terms of the folks who would actually pull you aside, like you said, and sort of say, hey, you might have handled that differently or uh, you do want to show up at that, those were almost all women for me. Yeah. Interesting. So let's get in terms of like actually talking like more on the ground campaign stuff. You have a ch- chapter in your book where you talk about by elections and you yeah. love by elections. Uh, I I don't love by elections as much. Um, I I you know I've uh, uh, you know run them the, the same as you. But one of the things and 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 I'm kind of more getting into an operational like on the ground stuff because that's both of kind of what our 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 sure. specialty is what we enjoy doing. And you talk about. Um, uh, the Wentf- Wentworth North, I think it was, by election. Yeah. And uh, uh, one of the lessons you learned was that the candidate, Chris Ward, said that uh, don't worry about these these polls, these 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 voters, because they're my friends. They're going to come out. And uh, it kind of reminded me, we say go hunting where the ducks are. I, we had talked earlier, you say go fishing where the where the fish are. But what are the some of the the Because we don't believe in long guns. Yes, yeah, that's, that's right. So we fish where the fish are. You, 
<laughs> yes, you you want to penalize you want to penalize uh, law abiding uh, fishing. Uh, we're fine with gun, fish gun. to your heart's content. Uh, 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 gun you have a license. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so what are some of the the uh, what are some of the rule like what are some of the lessons you learned in by elections and and just what are some of the stories because you talk about Wentworth North you talk about Vaughn um, uh, what are some of Christine kind of, Hart uh, yeah. So I'll tell you why I love by-elections. It's because of the pressure. Like, and I know that sounds kind of weird to say, but you know, nothing focuses you more than a deadline that's not going to move. An election day is not going to move. Yep. So nothing, nothing gives you the opportunity to focus a team more than saying to them, "This is the day. We can't. We can't wait. We have to get this done now." Uh, so I, I like that because it. It allows me my. It, it works well with my leadership style, which is let's just keep going and get this done, right? So, um, in the heart in the Chris Ward by election, it the big thing for me was was my real first one uh, after. Who's Chris Ward? So Chris Ward was a local mayor. So Eric Cunningham, who was a liberal uh, MPP, held the seat. He retired a little bit unexpectedly, uh, and Chris uh, stepped up to run for that nomination. So this was 1984. Peterson was nowhere on the scene, right? Peterson, David Peterson, later became premier, was still the, <laughs> you know, in transition to the more suave red tie David Peterson. Yeah, he still wore glasses. He still wore glasses. Hadn't grown his he, winter beard no, yet. No, he Trudeau. didn't, you know, he, he was <laughs> kind of geeky, as they all said, from London. Nobody knew who he was. So, so we needed it to show some momentum, uh, and by this point, um, Davis had also announced his retirement. So we knew that we had this big opportunity. And, and Guelph, you, you held these seats currently. Like this Wentworth held- North had been held by Eric Cunningham, and he had yes. retired. So yes, it was a so liberal area, seat. Yeah. So there was also the pressure to hold a liberal yeah. seat. So. Um, and you're how old? Uh, I'm 26, maybe 27, okay. just transitioning from Guelph to Toronto, moving from Guelph to Queens Park. I had. I hadn't even actually moved yet, but I had taken the job at Queen's Park. So so that was a lot of pressure on me, so I put a lot of pressure on the group. But the, he had a great, fantastic uh, team who really, Chris Ward did, who really wanted him to uh, win. So we were full out in there, um, but we didn't have many resources. Like, we weren't in government. We were in opposition. So the fight was good, um, but... Um, they, the conservatives ran Ann Sloat. I don't remember, she was the mayor of Ancaster. Uh, tough. This is 84. This is 1984. Right. Okay, you guys, oh yeah, or whatever. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I look, we're going to have a generational. I don't remember the mayor of Ancaster. I'm sorry to we're say. We're going to have a generational issue here, I'm for sure. I, 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 nor, I normally razz David about age, but I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say how old I was during your 1984 by-election. Exactly. So we fight, uh, were you even born? Yeah. I, Barely. God love you. We, God uh, love you. No, yeah. I wasn't. No. <laughs> we um, so we fought. We fought hard. But uh, so the, the the thing went great. Except on election day, I made a big mistake. I listened to the candidate. Never listened to candidate again. I listened to the candidate who said, "Don't worry about the five or six polls around my neighborhood. They'll all vote. They're going to be great." We had few resources, so I took that at face value and put our people elsewhere. We lost by. 380 votes, and those votes were definitely in yep. those polls. They did; they were like every other part of the writing. So that was a massive lesson for me. And I say in the book about um, the media called it Bill Davis's gold watch because it was the last by election. And as I say, my my only my only happiness from that was that uh, the general happened so fast that she never got to take her seat. But and we took the Chris yep. Ward did win it and became a cabinet minister. You both did by elections while you were in government. Yes. I don't know how to win by elections when you're in government. How do you do it? Like, what's your pitch? Like, how do you get people to bother to come out when the government's not at risk to come out in enough numbers to swarm the angry people we, that we are act- always going to vote against you? We actually won a fair bit of by elections, actually, in government. I know you did. So, um, how'd you do it? Well, but it's, it, it comes down to it like, for those by elections, it was a little bit of a lot of luck. Um, and in some cases, it's actually on the ground uh, organization. So there's certain by-elections like Vaughn, for example. It is the only time that going into a by-election, Fantino for us was a star candidate. He, he was a star candidate generally. If we had had anyone else— He was else, a superstar. Yeah, yeah any, if we had had anyone else running in that by-election in 2010, other than Julian Fantino, we would not have won that seat. We won it by 1,000 votes. Do you know that she— were, Yes. Yeah, I, so I, I totally, know. there you go. This is Pat Cerbera's last stand with Ignatia. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, so, so for that, it was, it was candidate in, you know, Brandon Suris, for example, that was a seat that, uh, the PC party had won in 97. 
Um, it was a seat we won by, I think, 20,000 votes in 2011. In 2013, we won with 389 votes. That was sheer uh, pulling out uh, every vote that you could possibly uh, possibly, uh, possibly get. Yeah. And it depends on where you are in the cycle as a government, yeah. right? So for Christine Hart, 1986, right, we had— done the accord, the Liberals had done the accord with the NDP in 85. Yeah. This is 86. They were, were still in a pretty good place, right, as a, as a government. So it was it was pretty easy to pull that one off. Um, you know, Scarborough. Buzz, it got to Scar- Scarborough, under ours, and, Scarborough yeah, Rouge our River. Scarborough, yeah. Yeah, well, that, yeah, we should have held on to that one, obviously, but um, but it was it was declining days, right? It was the beginning of declining days, and it was really tough. And we didn't have a we didn't have a star a star candidate. Can, I agree with Jenny. A star candidate can make the big difference, but we didn't have that. And, and Fantino's the only one I've ever, ever. They all most candidates think they're stars. Fantino was genuinely the only what I would call an actual star candidate. Right. I mean, the only way I uh, partly argue the only way we held on to Sudbury, and and I said it first in this podcast yeah. um, was Glenn Tebow. Right? He he was deeply loved uh, in Sudbury and. He was able to push through all the craziness to win it. Right. Now, and so and on Canada. the ground. And on the ground organization, like Jenny said, you no 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 vote left behind kind of thing. Hmm. Now did you guys and, and David and I've talked about this before, how are most election days, do you know going into election whether like for me I've pretty much known a win or a loss, minus the Brandon by election that by I just election talked about. Or generally. Gen- generally. I, I've known we're going to win or we're going to to lose. So on a by-election, I would say virtually never. You you go in terrified because you just don't know whether because turnout is yeah. so low in and by-elections. And you have no reliable polling. Well, even the reliable polling. I mean, you talked about Vaughn. Um, the day, two or three days before the Vaughn by-election, I got a note from Gordon Ashworth saying we were going to lose by 16%. And I knew there was no way in heck we were losing by 16%. Yeah. We lost by less than 1%. I mean, it had been our seat for 22 years under Maurizio Bevilacqua, and we fought for it. Um, yeah. We're like, and <laughs> Maurizio's come up on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. When you said earlier, you, I still maintain to this day that he could have made a big difference if he'd actually still stayed as a liberal in that by-election. But um, he, uh, you know, I knew that. I knew we weren't going to lose by 16%. But I didn't know whether we could pull it off with what mm. we, we pushed very hard. Um, in general elections, I would say, yeah, we have a pretty good sense of, of being able, whether we're, good, whether we're pulling it off for sure. Because by then you've targeted your seats, yeah. right? You know what you're going into. You know which seats you believe you can win. You've already crossed those off and you're in the middle zone of what you can pull On off. On the day so, of the yes. 2014 election, yeah. provincially, uh, Ipsos Reid came out with a poll that said the Conservatives were six points ahead. Right. And I had been telling the Premier and Jane as we coasted around in the on the tour in the uh, Winnebago or whatever the devil it was, yeah. um, that we were going to win. So they had some questions for me on yeah. election day, yeah. right? As this Ipsos Reed Oh, I remember you had out. to take that call early right. in the morning. I had yeah. to walk them through yeah. the data and tell yeah. them, no, it's, you know... Um, it's crystal clear. But um, when yeah. you're doing a general, you have enough polling data that you ought to know. I've never not known yeah. what was going to happen in the election. Uh, but on by-elections, I've never had a clue. Okay. Mm, never had a clue. What, well, maybe just if I can ask you, we would. there's also always the debate on what you, what you tell the ground and not tell the ground. Yeah. Do you tell your folks out in the ridings kind of what's happening to, or not, to, depending to, on that? To a, to a certain extent. Um uh, to a certain extent, well, by elections are different because we're running right, them. So the right. people on the ground are Always. are are the people that you essentially are putting in there uh, that you're putting in there. Uh, anyways, yeah. I've normally always had a conversation with the candidate, at, at least if it happens two hours before the polls yeah. close, whether, you know, we've got this or uh, just so you know, so, you know, you and your spouse are not shocked um, right. in two hours when the polls close. We we don't have, have this. Mm. Um, uh, so uh, I think it, you know, uh, it just depends. It, it, I, I really think it, 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 uh, it depends. I, I go a lot on like, polling data, but I've also gone on voter ID numbers. Like right. I can kind of glance at voter ID numbers and get a sense as to uh, how well how well we're going to do. And, and so in 2015, for example, I have, if I could go back to 
lessons learned or uh, if I'm the most proud of certain things that happened, even though we lost in 2015, um, hanging on to about 15 seats that uh, I think two weeks before the campaign ended, we weren't going to hang on to based on right. the resources that we were able to move around and, and allocate. Uh, it was probably... Uh, I could go riding by riding and be more proud of certain ridings in 2015 than I would in in uh, in 2011, and that was based on voter ID, like knowing kind of where we were at in terms of of uh, of riding. So it's not only do we have the most ID'd votes in that riding, that the ridings that I that I'd seen in camp, previous campaigns, we also had the most. Uh, non-supporters identified, and normally you don't actually identify many non-supporters. Right. People aren't, right. aren't people, telling you. People aren't going to tell you. People are just kind of are going to ignore. But at this point, like with three weeks left to go in the 2015 campaign, uh, our non-supporter ratio was Trump, like trumping our uh, supporter, yeah. uh, our supporter ratio. So for me, I can talk about 2015. Is there a campaign that you're most proud of or you've most learned from uh, in, over the years, different things? Yeah, that's got to be 2014 for me because I just had such a different role and, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of the being the campaign director and... Um, well, in 2014, you talk about uh, an exchange that, that you guys had where uh, you decided to go on the, the bus or the Winnebago yeah. for the last uh, week it was of the a campaign. Bus. It was a bus, baby. <laughs> there wasn't a Winnebago. <laughs> It was a real full bus. <laughs> it had rats. It said Kathleen Wynn on the outside. I remember. It was nice. Bus. Yeah, yeah. It was nice. It was nice there was bus. a washroom. Yeah. yeah. Very bad food until I got on there. Yeah, I gather that. Yeah. I gather you changed yeah, it's that. All yeah. health food until I got on that oh, bus. Oh, well. And so you talk about, like, so so the exchange where you, you must have known then with a week, to, like, you were you guys were poised to win or winning the election. Well, Pat and I had a, Pat and I had a division of labor in which I was largely overseeing the advertising, messaging, communications of the campaign. Campaign, and she was overseeing the organizational part of the campaign. And as we got closer to the end, we weren't going to produce another ad. Um, and uh, most of the strategic decisions had been made. And yeah. I, I was just kind of getting in her hair, I thought. Um, and uh, so I went out to... Uh, I went out to see what things were like on the tour and spent some time with the premier. And then as it turns out, we had a rough patch yep. that we had to work through because the yep. OPP decided to take another initiative on uh, something to do with the gas plant yeah, emails or some My, bloody uh, thing uh, that sent us into a bit of a tailspin in the last week. And Pat had to manage that at headquarters and we worked, but we were talking all the time oh, every yeah, day yeah. anyway. But it was, I, I just thought that it was time for Pat to fully be in charge of it at that point. So the, the big thing for me was the differentiation, uh, was division of labor, I mean, we worked in each other's territory, but understanding David was air war, I was ground war, and then like one of my favorite, and it didn't end up, I think it got cut from the book, but you know, we'd had these, I started out having these meetings that uh, you'd have the, the strategists and the ground people in the room, so the tour people, the people that were doing the regional organization. I thought that would be efficient, but I found, so we do the vision, the strategy, what do we want, what was our messaging for yep. the next day, uh, then we'd bring in the tour and the organizational people to talk about how to execute it. And I, I think this is in the book. So I say, I realized that then, you know, uh, the guys who were the visionaries would take that extra hour and a half opportunity to change their minds, to refine, to go back and forth. <laughs> and so finally I just said to David, that's it. I have to divide these meetings because you guys have to decide and then we have to execute. You can't use it, you know, go back and forth and back and forth. And there were some who just couldn't let go. So we that's what that was like an a learning an early learning moment for me at that level of execution, which I had not mm -hmm. done before. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really like seeing it and then acting on it. We also, because we were government, very early on, some of the senior government people had a lot of trouble understanding that the decision making had moved to the campaign team, mm -hmm. and you know pol policy guys would still go to maybe one of the senior government guys to get a policy decision, and they'd have to, anyway. So that, there was a lot of that going on at the beginning, um, but we got into a groove pretty fast, and I think that was it f because I had that level of authority getting it to run mm -hmm. at the level I wanted it to run. That was pretty amazing for me. When Pat is chairing a meeting and weary of the conversation, it becomes fairly evident. <laughs> <laughs> like when, when I finally had the platform discussion and um, right, we were about, people were like, oh God, Pat's going to be so painful. And about f I said, no, I'll be okay. About five minutes in, I pulled out this big sticker that said, fuck policy and put it on my back. 
<laughs> and uh, that kind of set the tone for the rest of it. We have to take a quick break for a word from our sponsor. Ontario realtors live and breathe their communities. They're connected to the people, places, and things that make their neighborhoods tick. But why do they do it? That's easy. Building stronger communities is part of their DNA. It's the people and places that drive them to be civic leaders, ambassadors, and builders. The Ontario Real Estate Association is proud to support Ontario's 80,000 realtors and all they do to build stronger communities. Go to realtorscareontario.ca to learn more. All right, folks, we're back. We're back. Um, so there was uh, one of the things, and and I thought about this after, I, I didn't realize it till after I left politics. I never felt that uh, being a woman in kind of what is a male-dominated uh, profession, I never felt it held me back. I never th- thought there were any issues. In looking back at moments in my career, I actually think that probably um, it, it did. And and I know there were some, some kind of, some different, quotes in in uh in uh in your book uh you know talking about politics as a uh, a blood sport uh you know there's a in Machiavelli quote you know there's a fine line between the boss and and uh and and being liked and I th- I, and I, I just want to get your take because I found in looking back now I was always a little bit sharper and a little bit tougher and probably a little bit more I hate to say abrasive but t- uh, but but it, kind of more thick skinned than probably my male colleagues had to be because yeah. looking back, you know, when you're a 30 year old sitting around a table in the prime minister's office, uh, if you're going to be, if you're going to be heard, if you're going to have any influence, um, you kind of have to be a bit tougher. And you were often probably the only woman in the room. Sometimes. Yeah. yeah. There, my, my favorite picture that I have um, of me, there's a, uh, from our trip to Israel, and this was in 2014. So I was a I was a deputy chief of staff at the time, and and I I kind of led the the uh, advance and and the organization for the trip. And there's a bilat meeting between uh, Pre- uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and Prime Minister Harper, and there is I think it was leader plus ten, and I am literally the only woman sitting at the. Um, at the table for yeah. for both sides, uh, and so I'm I'm assuming that there were times in your career that you might not have even realized it at the time, but the reputations that people like you and I got were simply because otherwise we wouldn't have gotten to the level we were if we Correct. were not actually tougher than everyone else in the room. Absolutely right. Like that that became the fight for me as I got as I got even into the early parts of the career. Um, I don't think people were conscious of how much they sort of. Uh, f- moved toward a man for a senior position. Mm-hmm. But if you were a woman looking to get into that senior position, yes, you had to kind of really ha- find your voice. And I talk about that a lot in the book, right? My advice to young people coming into politics, male or female, but particularly young women, find your voice, find a place at the table, and then do your homework and be heard, right? Mm-hmm. Make, do your homework's an important part too. But I think um, I think also it's a lot about how we're raised and and what we learn along the way. And I, you know, I think we're going to talk a little bit about imposter syndrome. But you know, I say there's a, a, a there's a lesson in there about no matter how accomplished you are, when you punch above your weight, right? Because we're sitting at yep. tables with some pretty big names and some pretty big people. When you punch above your weight, you're going to feel like a fraud, right? Inside, yeah, and that's the, that's the fight I had more often than not. It was like sometimes I'd look around and what am I doing at this table? And you know, you second guess yourself a lot. Maybe that was part of my Italian upbringing. I don't know, but it was certainly there. So um, that fight was happening at, at two levels. And the minute you showed some weakness, what I found was the minute you showed weakness, yes. so you second guessed yourself, then you were in trouble. So it was the question of whether you just barreled through and let people think you were just being. Uh, difficult and unpleasant or whatever, or you uh, step back, reassessed, and went at it again. It was it was always that fine line for me. I, I and I don't know about you. I know you you talk about your your father in the book. I, I my dad was a huge is a, is a huge influence in my uh, in my life. And I uh, I think growing up, um, I didn't realize like he had he was he's a my dad uh, is a former builder, carpenter, uh, hunter, fisher, fisherman. Um, and I, you know, I played baseball, I played ringette, um, I played hockey, all the stuff that he had me do. Uh, and, and, uh, he kind of raised me to never look at it. I was just a girl. Like it right. was like, so he's the reason I got involved in politics. He's, he, you know, we would, 
you know, talk politics or current events at the dinner table and, and what have you. And do you think your dad, whether consciously or not, was part of the reason why you never just thought of your, I'm just not a girl at this table. I'm, I'm just I, like, I'm Pat. I'm, I'm, I'm. No, it was a, it, that's a much more confusing road for me in the context of we were five girls and my okay. mom and dad was a patriarch. I mean, they, he yeah. was in charge. So that battle started very early for me in terms of being heard, in terms of, going down a road that he wasn't happy with. So in some ways I learned, I learned to fight the fight, but in other ways uh, the, the fear of the male reaction had been there mm-hmm. from an early day, and I talked about that a little bit in the book. But when it came to politics, he, he was extremely supportive. He, I learned a lot about my politics through, through my dad. So it was a, it was a very different thing. Um, I think that's why I think many of my mentors were women, because it goes back to the issue of I had to see successful women role <laughs> models to know I could be a successful woman in politics. But you had moved through, I mean, tell me I'm wrong. It seemed to me like you had moved through the party pretty rapidly. Yeah. I mean, the Lynn McLeod leadership campaign, yeah. speaking of names nobody listening to the podcast will remember. but the. And I actually want to talk about this because there's a couple stories. That- yeah, Lynn McLeod replaced... Uh, um, David Peterson. David Peterson as the leader of the Liberal Party, and you effectively ran her campaign for leader, and she wouldn't have been a front runner coming out of the gate, so that was a uh, an impressive campaign to have won. But you were pretty young to be running a leadership campaign. Right? I was in, in my thirties doing my MBA, but let's be clear, I I, I ran at the organizational level. You know, Tom Allison, Bob Richardson's. There were lots of other players in there, mm. um, and I wasn't full time. But yes, I when to, when it came down to actually getting the delegate reality put together, uh, that that fell in a good part to me. And yeah, but again, um, it 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 was a moment in time. Like in to have a career in politics, it's a very different. And actually, I left after that, went into the private sector, and didn't mm. come back into politics for a little while. So. Um, yeah, but young, yes, for sure, and that was part of it too. The youth, the as a young person, fighting through to so get how that level get of responsibility. How did you get that? Did you create it for yourself, or did somebody come and ask you to do that job? Uh, I had been asked to be more involved, but as I said, I'd gone to Queens to do mm-hmm. my MBA, so I wasn't around. And as I tell the story in the book about only after Elson came into the race, and I kind of got challenged to to make sure this woman, the first woman, could become the leader of a party in Ontario. Um, that challenge called to me as as well as the suggestion that she should be shunted, shunted aside for a male coming in at the last minute. So, um, I mean, it always it always it always called to me. You know, there was never a, any doubt about that. But um, no, I, I kind of inserted myself at that moment and just kind of took over. I talk a lot and let them howl about if you show a willingness to take on responsibility. If you do put your hand up. If you do uh, take on every job or be part of every job, then. People recognize that and hand you more and more and more of it. That well, that natural, I think. Well, we've probably all seen it. Uh, there are people that want to be part of campaigns that we've we've run, and what they want to do is, uh, you know, how many times have you gotten a phone call from someone going, "I am a senior campaign strategist right. that specializes in like strategy and communications," and that's like okay, um, but what are you actually going to uh, to do? So, if people are willing to actually take on roles and responsibilities. Like if you're willing to be accountable for something, um, right. you're going to end up getting the getting the job because, you know, otherwise campaigns are littered with senior strategists that have no ultimate responsibility. Yeah. So how many jobs did you do, the two of you, without the title? Oh. Where oh. somebody else had the title and you did the more, job? More, more, than, more than I've had the title. Okay. Oh, me too, me too. And, and it never, I'll be honest, it never bothered me. Like, I don't look back and think that it was, um, you know, I have any regrets or I, I, I would go back. There is, there is nothing I would have done different back then uh, where I was doing the job and, and, uh, and didn't have the title. And for me, it was, um, and I think you're the same. You have an ability to bring focus to a team, Right. What are the priorities every day? What's the focus? What do we have to get done? And that's that's I find in any part of the world that's not a a, a common reality. So mm. in politics, that and people just naturally then lead toward you. So whether you have the title or not, they look to you for that leadership because because you're you can provide it. it so it's the ability to make a decision because yeah, that's how many like, you know it's it. it's how many times we sit around we all sit around the table and and we go through the same topics. You've got to. Uh, you've got to be able to make a decision, and whether it's right or wrong, you have to be able to stand by 
um, stand by the decision. Like throwing the senior strategists out of the out of the meeting for the second half. That was an important <laughs> that decision is to be made. Yeah. Um, do you find it? I have a very uh, so you know it's t- we we talk about recruiting women to politics, and I love to see uh, more women in politics, uh, especially um, I you know at the in the pu- the public level because I, I I don't consider myself at the public level. I talk to the media now, which I never did before. But um, yeah, me do too. You, do you <laughs> do you do you find it's actually it's hard to actually rec- like. <laughs> I would say we are not the average even women in politics no. because we're will like it has become a center of our life and it's and it's what we 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 do and that's a choice I have made and I have no regrets to and make that it. choice and I love it. Right. But at the end of the day to recruit women who are in business or um uh, different acad- academia to recruit them to actually run for office it's hard to be completely honest as to what they're like how it is going to uh, how it is going to change their lives. And so right. I don't know if you've had this, like I've even had members of my family who don't fully comprehend um, that uh, what I I do for a living. And now it's, I just, I dabble in politics. I don't make a living from it, but they still have a very hard time. It's like, you know, they watch House of Cards or they watch this political yeah. show and they're like, this is what your life is like. And they're, I'm like, no, no one's throwing someone in front of a subway. Right, uh, right. It's yeah. not nearly yeah. as exciting as that. It's, it's door knocking in Brandon or Sudbury or where, uh, where have you? Have you found it challenging to like recruit over your career to recruit women? Um, uh, I'm thinking less in the back rooms, but more in the front rooms to be able because right. it's it is a a, a a it is a blood sport, as you say in the in yeah. the book. I, I think it's not only recruiting them, but retaining right, getting yeah. them to stay because so many women tend to leave after one or two elections because of the. Um, the reality is not at all what we sell it as. I think women are really interested in politics because they know it's a place where you can make change. What they don't understand about politics is then just how much of a blood sport, as we say, that it is or how difficult it yes. can become. So what I found over the years was that um, what you have to try and do is um, – in recruiting a woman, getting them to admit kind of what, what they need to be successful mm-hmm. and then trying to make sure they have that around them even after they hopefully get elected. So in a campaign or in a, you know, like they'll, if you get them, if you get them to talk about family or get them to talk about, uh, you know, what does this mean to my job or my long time, my my career prospects and that kind of thing. You know, when, when we were recruiting, for example, Natalie DeRogier, um, she was really struggling uh, because she was worried about whether... She was a great recruit. She, she was giving a up great a lot. recruit. She was giving up, uh, you know, and she was really worried. What she, what she was worried she was giving up was the ability to go back into the teaching and law and whatnot. Yeah. And, um, you know, I... I I got Roy McMurtry to call her mm-hmm. because she needed to talk to somebody who'd been through it. And, you know, Roy said, that is my, that is the, being a cabinet minister was the best job I ever had. And so when they talked more like peer to peer, and he said, of course you can go back and talk through all, and now she's at Massey College, so I guess that worked out. But, mm. um, you know, that, that's kind of stuff you have to really listen, and, and it takes a lot longer as a result. Uh, I talked Women to are just so much more responsible about these things. Much more responsible. When you, <laughs> when you recruit a man to be a candidate, it's ego. And this has been the same from 1980 to me to 2018. When you recruit a man, the first thing that happens is he gets his. When you ask him to run, if he's interested in running, he puffs up his chest. And he starts to tell you about what a great candidate he'd be, right. and how popular he is, how well known he is, right. and a And then he starts talking to you about what his job might be if he got elected, right. and what his role might be. Yeah. Right. You start the conversation with women, and they start talking to you about their families yeah. and about their homes and about you know all these considerations what they and how change, they would manage, you know, why they want to go. Yeah, yeah. And so it's you know it's just a whole different conversation. And for me, I, when there's a when the Man is going through that, and there's a woman sitting there. I find myself thinking, maybe she'd run. Maybe. <laughs> I know. So often you're with a couple. She's interested. And you're thinking, I think yeah. the wife's the better candidate. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but it, it is tough, and and then it's tough once they're in there and what they're up against. So I think they need a different set of support and network all the way through. And I don't think we're as conscious of it as we need to be. And it worries me because so many women do end up leaving. Uh, I agree. You know? 100%. Or don't try again. Sometimes they don't win, but they don't try again. Um, we, you like me have gone through tough where we're backroom people, but we've actually been become public figures, not, 
uh, by our by, choosing. By our choosing. Yes. And so for me, uh, the 2015 campaign uh, was somewhere where some was a was a point where I ended up making the press just because there were internal uh, dynamics that were happening in, happening in our campaign. Most of what was reported was was uh, was not true. I'm not saying it wasn't a tough campaign. Um, and uh, um, a, a, as I said, we ended up, you know, doing better in that campaign than than I than I thought. We we worked together. There were certain. Was there was there a moment? It'll be weird for me for me to actually say this. There was a moment where you actually just start to feel better about things. And I actually, weirdly enough, um, I received a call from Jerry Butts during the 2015 campaign when I was at the height of leading the national news, not by my own right. choosing. And at this point. You know, my grandmother is reading the front page of the Toronto <laughs> Star, and it, it's just, it's it's like campaigns are tough enough uh, when you like not having to, you know, deal with with that stuff. And Jerry actually called me to just say, you know, hang in. Um, I'm sorry you're going through this. I, uh, I, uh, you know, what uh, a nice gesture. It was yeah. a very nice gesture, and he actually said a quote, and and. Uh, it, he used a quote from uh, from The Godfather. He's like, he goes, "At the end of the day, Jenny, this is the business we've chosen." Yeah. And it was a it was a quote from uh, from the uh, from the first Godfather. Was there any moments that um, that just it was even if they're small was just kind of an epiphany of like, okay, this is this will just actually make me tougher. Like for me, that that was a defining moment which I'll never forget. And I had a lot of friends and what have you. And I kind of took 2016 off to lick my wounds. We've all taken time off, I think, from politics to lick wounds. But is there is there times where, for both of you, that it's just been like, okay, well, no one dies in politics. We'll all be back. And it, it, this isn't as bad as what it seems. No, it's always been as bad as it seems. And I have died in politics. Yeah. <laughs> but, you, but you rose again. You rose, you're right. You can, the thing about politics, somebody, well, some politician said, you can be killed many times in politics, right? But you can rise again. Good, good people never die, die in politics. Yeah, no, or something like no. that. But for me, you know, I mean, the, the big overlay for me, though, was the investigation, right? Mm-hmm. Like there was a whole layer that you wouldn't, you know, you might have a campaign go bad, but this layer of uh, the OPP investigation and then being charged. I mean, f- just so you know, the the person for me who, from the other, from another party who made that kind of call was Jamie Watt who, first of all, just called bullshit on the whole thing that was yeah. happening in the investigation. But he also said, like, remember the cycle. Politics are cycles, and you'll be able to come back and all of that. I don't I don't know that I'll come back in that way, but now. Uh, but uh, I would say that one— I would not be shocked if somehow we're all—I'm running— like, you guys are running a campaign against me someday. Well, well you know what? I, I, you know, that would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> Only if we got to talk every that, week that, or something. Yeah. That would that, that, that would be fun. I think that would uh, I'd be interested in the candidate that would make that. Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Anyway, sorry, that, I didn't mean no, to no, that no, no. So I mean, for me, there I, the the way I got through it in the end was writing that book, right? Mm-hmm. Like I I didn't I didn't write it because I wanted to write a most people said well, you're writing a book. David was like, what? You're writing a book, but. It was the way of getting through that tough. It was the way of managing it all in my emotion and my the, the heart part, like all that stuff. So that's what I poured into that book. Um, beyond that, there's still you know it would political side. I, I think I don't. I've, I've certainly been asked to go back in, but I don't think I'm damaged quite in that way. But it's hard. It's I don't know. I'm I have PTSD now when it comes to politics. So that's that's the outcome of the trial stuff for me in the post trial. I I don't get over them. Yeah, David doesn't get over I them. I don't get no. over them. I mean, the 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 um like when Paul lost in 2006. I you know I mean for me that had been my entire adult life. Right? That that had been the project of my life and we finally got there. And then, yeah. you know, you and I love Elton John. There's a Bernie Taupin lyric that says, I spent all of my life trying to get it right. I put it together and it falls apart. Yeah. And that's how I felt about uh, about 2006. And I carried that around for a long time. And I have to say, 2018, everybody says to me, you shouldn't care about it. It was unwinnable. You shouldn't take too much. I, that broke me. Literally broke me. Yeah. The fact that I could not figure out a way through that. And figure I out a way to change that. I, I went away and hid for a year after that. And I don't think people understand in the back rooms that people involved at the level that we are and put our heart and soul into it actually experience these moments, right? Mm-hmm. They, you know, I agree. You know, they think yeah. that we're just, you know, um, 
what do you call them, like hired guns kind of yes. stuff, and that it doesn't matter. Well, it matters much, to, so much to us that we carry it. I, I will always also carry 2018 in a different way. Um, yeah, and lots of times. And because because you're somebody who works hard and believe that you can make change when you actually can't pull it off, it's pretty hard to accept. Well, well, and that must it, have been that way for you in 2015. Uh, tw- it, it, exactly, because these beca- it becomes your life. To, to your point about your adult life being Paul Martin, my adult life was, was Stephen Harper. Right. So um, in 2015, not only was it the loss, it was also then the change of like your entire life. So you go from spending 15 years like every morning and every like being part of this community of people that you speak to. I remember waking up the day after the 2015 campaign and it being the first day that there wasn't a scheduled conference call for me to be on. And, you know, there were days where even when I, even I was in the prime minister's office and I traveled, I wasn't on the call, but there was a scheduled conference call. You wake up the next day and I remember like looking at my phone going, huh, I don't have a call. For the first time in 15 years, I'm not going to be on a conference hmm. call with this, mostly the same people. And, right. and uh, it, it's, a, it, it's a lifestyle change for people like us that, to your point, have spent our entire adult lives doing these, uh, doing yeah. these things. Right. Yeah. And then how quickly you fall off the, the radar screen completely, right? So the yeah, day of, right. the, the, every day up to the election, you have more emails than you have any chance yes. to look at. Right. right. The day after the election, you have a lot of condolence emails from people. Yes. The day after the day after the election, you have no emails. I, I found <laughs> myself. I found myself. I so after the 2015 <laughs> campaign, um, uh, my best friend Lynette Corbett and I uh, uh, went to uh, went to Florida for uh, for a few weeks, and I remember. Uh, I remember sitting out by this pool and like looking at my phone and saying, "Hey, Lynette, can you send me an email? I think my phone, <laughs> I think there's something wrong with my phone. I'm not getting service here in Florida. It's this Rome is your home is not not working." And in. her going, "Okay, but I, 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 I'm I'm pretty sure your phone's working." <laughs> exactly. That's hard. Um, anyways, yeah. so. But but as I said, the balance between what you get out of it and these, like we're talking yes. about the tough moments at the end. But as I say, there's no life like it, right? So what you what you learn, what you experience, the highs of it, I, I still would not trade a single moment of that for what I ended yes. up going through. I really I really wouldn't. Um, the highs are very high. The highs are very high, and and the success is very different. Even when I had a company and we had success, because it was. This is more like uh, peaks and valleys, mm-hmm. right? Uh, in, in when I had the company, it was more like, you know, just steady stream. The peaks that we go through in politics are pretty amazing. And, mm. you know, when I look at pictures of you guys with world leaders that you've met and all those kinds, I was in the bar, I never even got to meet many of those, but that, that's pretty exciting stuff too, right? Stuff you mm-hmm. get to do in government mm-hmm. that you would never get to do in almost any other yes. career in so the world. So what's it like to be a new Democrat? No peaks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How do well, they get through? Well, it's very true. <laughs> well, I guess Bob you're there for, Ray. You're yeah. there for he, different he, reasons. He was, he was a peak here he in Ontario. Peak, yeah, they don't claim that really as a peak of their party anymore. No, though. they don't. Um, Ray Days. <laughs> Some, so even, even people that weren't born in the early 90s know what uh, know what Ray Days, uh, they do. Uh, Ray Days are. Mm. Any, any other topic? You guys you faced off in 2011 federally. You got to talk about the federal, the 2011 <laughs> federal campaign. What went you on there? You weren't going to let that go. What went on there? I'd like to hear both of your perspectives on the 2011 federal campaign. Well, I think that, uh, listen, I think we were at the peak, of, like Stephen Harper was, he had built a coalition. He was an effective prime minister. We'd been in power for five years um, at that point. Uh, the economy, uh, he had uh, steered the economy through the 2008 uh, uh, yeah. uh, steady downfall. It was mm-hmm. very, very, very steady. Um, and I think there were factors that, as I said earlier, there were a bit of luck. The NDP were the 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 surge of of Jack Layton was luck. I think Mike Lignatch of being the Liberal leader, and and uh, I've said this before on the podcast, uh, people seem to be uh, loathe him. Um, that actually helped a bit, and probably helped the mm. uh, helped the NDP. I've I've joked that. That uh, that election, Elizabeth May reminded every man of his first wife, and and Mike Lignatchev reminded every woman of of her first husband, um, uh, which was a uh, uh, which which was a help. So I, I think that for us, we were we were at like the peak of actually of do like like our ground organization, our tour, our team. Uh, we had done uh, for the most part three campaigns together uh, at that point. Uh, so 70% of us had, had, had three machine. campaigns. We were, we, were, uh, we were a machine. 
So uh, uh, to me, 2011 federal was like the 2018. Danolo, Peter Danolo, uh, who had gone up to uh, try and pull the liberal side of things together and took me along with him. Uh, Gordon Ashworth was running the campaign. I was the deputy campaign director. Like, like you in 2018, they could not find a way through. Like, I remember Peter turning to me and saying, the only way we're going to be able to uh, potentially get a shift here is to go actually into a campaign because it was a minority. Yep. And so it was this back and forth. And we were trying a million things, right? And we couldn't get any traction around Mr. Gnatty. Like, he was not a natural leader in any way, shape, or form. And and it just, it just, there could be, so there was no traction on the leader side. There was no traction on the vision side. We just couldn't find a way through. So it was like, Go have the campaign and see what happens. And uh, and, and sometimes you just can't get a break. Happened. Like that we was one of the. Sometimes you just can't get a break. Like right. I remember you guys did the uh, the the Easter ad. The Mike Lignatchev doing. He he looked like an evangelical preacher uh, yeah. for mm. thirty minutes on there. There's rise some, up, rise up. Yep. Um, yeah. There, there's just there's that just that was his. That was all him, by the way. That was just. There's sometimes you just can't. You can't catch a break, and I think in 2011 that was for for you guys. Yeah, totally. So it leads me into the last question before we, that I have before we wrap up, okay. which is, I have to address this with you because it's in your book. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and we need to address it. Okay. In which you believe we should have pulled in our horns yeah. faster yeah. and harder earlier, earlier yeah. mm -hmm. uh, in the 2018 campaign. Yeah. So. You know, you asked her earlier about what do you tell the candidates in the ground about what's actually going on. Yeah. At what point do you think we could have revealed to people that we had no chance of winning the election? So what I what I tried to say there, and you and I have discussed this a few times, but um, not quite come to ground on it, is that is that we knew two years out, right? We one year out, we knew we were in trouble. You were trying many different things. We were trying. Kathleen Wynne was trying many things, the government, they were trying many different things, and again, getting no traction. Yep. So it seemed to me in the short time that I was back that there was an absence of an understanding what that meant riding by riding. And what I was trying to get to was that uh, pulling in the horns to the to the group of ridings that, you know, we might have yep. been able to hang on to, that, the, that at all costs we were going to put the fight into there, run them almost like by-elections, making sure that we could hold on. That decision could have been made as early as a, as a year out. And then and then you have room to expand, you have room to contract. But if you kind of don't you know what your core is... you have done it in a way that is, was at all visible to anybody. Well, sure you could have, because there are actually reasonable people out there on the ground who understand... Uh, that we are, like, there's not that was any surprise to the ground that we were in trouble. They all knew it. They were all saying it. They were just looking for a different no, potential approach. You can't approach. have a situation where you're the government in a year out from the election, people are saying, well, you're targeting 15 ridings. So, so to me, the word is when you are the government. Mm -hmm. And that's the part I'm going to, I object to, because in op you do it in opposition. Obviously, the NDP do it every election. Right. I mean, there are times when a party has to look at what it's what's really going on around it and be real, right? And it just seemed to me that even though we were the government, we were as a party with no money at that point, right? We were barely getting any money in. We I know what the realities yeah. were on the ground, Pat, but what about the realities in the air? Like, I mean, how can you say to a caucus of 60 people, we think only 20 of you are coming back, and have that caucus of 60 stay together? Well, I think I think they knew that probably only 20 of them were coming back. If, they were, if you were having realistic, it's all conditioning. Well, they would to have me, all thought they were part of the 20 all, if they well, did. Yeah, maybe, but they were, it was all conditioning, right? It would, have been, it would have been a lot. I'm not saying it would have been easy, but it would have been a lot of conditioning. And I'm not saying it would have been necessarily to tell them all either, but behind the scenes, right? You organize your ground accordingly, and... As I said a few times, you certainly wouldn't put people way out into ratings that you never had a chance in, even if we were doing well, right? The, mm. the, you pull the team tighter and try to make sure that those, for example, Toronto ridings that we might have held on to um, had the most attention early on and got the... Mm. That, that's all I was trying to get to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then we, the back and forth about whether... Uh, you had to pull back. You had to pull back a bit in 2015, Oh, right. tw 2015 by from the start of election from the start of the campaign August 3rd I think it was August 2nd um to the end of the campaign our what we would call our target list was like a hundred percent was a hundred percent different like yeah. we were putting resources into ridings that you know we had healthily won in like they were we called them the class of 2004 and so um we had no ch like we just had no 
we had we had no choice. Like right. there was by that point, we knew we weren't winning. It was a matter, like as I said, it was a matter of whether we were gonna we ended up winning ninety nine, whether it was gonna be eighty, or whether it was gonna be ninety nine. Right, and left a solid base behind. So I'm not saying that was an easy easy decision at, at all. I just I just think even um, in terms of being able to organize people accordingly. And I and I do think that the ground people would have been more accepting of it. Aside, I, I aside real, maybe like, from caucus, like, I felt right? the real obligation. I felt a real obligation. Let's give them as much hope as possible. I, I felt a real obligation to keep the enterprise in the air all the way to the red. Right, right. Right. And to do that, I felt I, I, I never lied to the caucus about what the situation was, right. but I always tried to show them a path right. to make them believe there exactly. was a path yes. forward. Yes. Right? Um, and you were always searching for that always path Always searching for that forward. path I think the thing I may have, may have implied to them that I believed in that path more than I did at times. And I, I don't want to, I think the difference for you, and we've talked about this, was that that that's the dynamic that we had in 2014, right? You left that to me to decide which riding's had a path forward in the yeah. end of the day, like yeah. really literally on the ground, and which ones didn't. And I don't think you had that same level of support in 2018. Mm. Great. Awesome. Awesome. Jenny, Pat, thank you for this episode of the Hurley Bernie. Thank you. This thank was you. a lot of <laughs> I love that name. This is a Scott's lot of gonna fun. Be so Jenny, jealous though. You're yeah. gonna, you yeah, are gonna Scott. ease me out of this whole operation <laughs> before too long. Pat, thank you for coming on. Thank you, David. Really. This was, a, Great. this was a lot of fun. Yeah. All it's right. It's out of my wheelhouse, but I mm-hmm. enjoyed so it. So I would like to thank our all of our listeners for tuning in and listening to this edition. I would like to thank our presenting sponsor, TELUS, and our original sponsor, uh, Orea, the Ontario Real Estate Association, and, of course, the Orange Lounge, Andy, our cameraman, Metal, our uh, recording technician and engineer, and the air quotes media team that's behind this whole operation. Thank you, everybody, and we'll be back uh, next week with uh, Jenny and Scott, and perhaps our newly named political panel. <laughs> <laughs>